Hi, it's Sydney Keane again with chapter 10, part 3 of Pinocchio. If you remember, Pinocchio had grown some ears and he went to look for his friend Candlewick to have a go at him, to chastise him. But when he turns up at Candlewick's house, he also finds that Candlewick has covered his face and his head with a cotton cap the same as he has. Now they are going to reveal all and take their caps off together on the count of three. At the word three, the two boys took off their caps and threw them into the air. And then a scene followed that would seem incredible if it were not true. That is, that when Pinocchio and Candlewick discovered that they were both struck with the same misfortune, instead of feeling full of mortification and grief, they began to prick their ungainly ears and to make a thousand antics, and they ended by going into bursts of laughter. And they laughed and laughed, until they had to hold themselves together. But in the midst of their merriment, Candlewick suddenly stopped, staggered, and changing colour, said to his friend, Help! Help, Pinocchio! What is the matter with you? Alas, I cannot any longer stand upright. No more can I, exclaimed Pinocchio, tottering and beginning to cry. And whilst they were talking, they both doubled up and began to run round the room on their hands and feet. And as they ran, their hands became hooves, their faces lengthened into muscles, and their backs became covered with a light grey, hairy coat sprinkled with black. But do you know what was the worst moment for these two wretched boys? The worst and the most humiliating moment was when their tails grew. Vanquished by shame and sorrow, they wept and lamented their fate. Oh, if they had been wiser. But instead of sighs and lamentation, they could only bray like asses. And they brayed loudly and said in chorus, Ea! 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 Whilst this was going on, someone knocked at the door, and a voice on the other side said, <laughs> Open the door. I am the coachman who brought you to this country. Open at once, or it will be worse for you. Finding that the door remained shut, the little man burst it open with a violent kick. And coming into the room, he said to Pinocchio and Candlewick with his usual laugh, <laughs> Uh, well done, boys! You braid well! <laughs> and I recognised you by your voices. That is why I'm here! At these words, the two little donkeys were quite stupefied and stood with their heads down, their ears lowered, and their tails between their legs. At first, the little man stroked and caressed them. Then, taking out a curry comb, he curry combed them well. And when, by this process, he had polished them till they shone like two mirrors, he put a halter round their necks and led them to the marketplace in hopes of selling them and making a good profit. And indeed, buyers were not wanting. Candlewick was bought by a peasant whose donkey had died the previous day. Pinocchio was sold to the director of a company of buffoons and tightrope dancers who bought him that he might teach him to leap and to dance with the other animals belonging to the company. Pinocchio tried to learn how to jump through hoops, but each time that he came in front of the hoop instead of going through it, he found it easier to go under it. At last he made a leap and went through it, but his right leg unfortunately caught in the hoop, and that caused him to fall to the ground, doubled up in a heap on the other side. When he got up, he was lame. 
and it was only with great difficulty that he managed to return to the stable. The following morning, the veterinary, that is, the doctor of animals, paid him a visit and declared that he was indeed lame. The director then said to the stable boy, Hmm, what do you suppose I can do with a lame donkey? Take him to the market and sell him. When they reached the market, a purchaser was found at once. He asked the stable boy, hmm, How much do you want for that the lame donkey? Twenty francs. I will give you ten pence. Twenty pence. Don't suppose that I am buying him to make use of. I am buying him solely for his skin. I see that his skin is very hard, and I intend to make a drum with it for the band in the, my village. I leave it to my readers and my listeners to imagine poor Pinocchio's feelings when he heard that he was destined to become a drum. As soon as the purchaser had paid his twenty pence, he conducted the little donkey to the seashore. He then put a stone around his neck and tying a rope to the end of which he held his hand round his leg, he gave him a sudden push and threw him into the water. Pinocchio, weighed down by the stone, went at once to the bottom, and his owner, keeping tight hold of the cord, sat down quietly on a piece of rock to wait until the little donkey was drowned, intending then to skin him. After Pinocchio had been fifty minutes under the water, his purchaser said aloud to himself, my poor little lame donkey must by now this time be quite drowned. I will therefore put him out of the water, and I will make a fine drum of his skin. So he began to haul in the rope that he had tied to the donkey's leg, and he hauled and hauled and hauled, until at last... What do you think appeared above the water? Instead of a little dead donkey, he saw a live puppet who was wriggling like an eel. Seeing this wooden puppet, the poor man thought he was dreaming, and struck dumb with astonishment. He remained with his mouth open and his eyes starting out of his head. Having somewhat recovered from his first stupefaction, he asked in a quivering voice, And the little donkey that I threw into the sea, what, what has become of him? I am the little donkey, said Pinocchio, laughing. You, I. Ah, you young scab, do you dare to make game of me? To make game of you? <laughs> Quite the contrary, my dear master. I am speaking seriously. But how can you? Who, who, who but a short time ago were a little donkey have become a wooden puppet only from having been left in water? It must have been the effect of the sea water. The sea makes extraordinary changes. Beware, puppet. Beware. Don't imagine that you can amuse yourself at my expense. Woe to you if I lose my patience. Well, master, do you wish to know this true story? If you will set my leg free, I will tell you. The good man, who was curious to hear the true story, immediately untied the knot that kept him bound, and Pinocchio, finding himself as free as a bird in the air, commenced as follows. You must know that I was once a puppet as I am now, and I was on the point of becoming a boy like the many that there are in the world, but instead, induced by my dislike to study and the advice of bad companions, I ran away from home. And one fine day, when I awoke, I found myself changed into a donkey with long ears and a long tail. What a disgrace it was for me. Taken to the market to be sold, I was bought by the director of an equestrian company who took it into his head to make a famous dancer of me. 
but I had a bad fall, and I lamed my legs. Then the director, not knowing what to do with me, a lame donkey, sent me to be sold, and you were the purchaser. Only too true, and I paid twenty pence for you. And now who will give me back my poor pennies? And why did you buy me? You bought me to make a drum of my skin. A drum? Only too true. And now where shall I find another skin? Don't despair, master. There are such a number of little donkeys in the world. Tell me, you impertinent rascal, does your story end here? No, answered Pinocchio. I have another two words to say, and then I shall be finished. After you have bought me, you brought me to this place to kill me. But then, yielding to a feeling of compassion, you preferred to tie a stone around my neck and to throw me into the sea. This humane feeling does you great honour, and shall, I shall always be grateful to you for it. But nevertheless, dear master, this time you made your calculations without considering the fairy. And who is the fairy? She is my mamma, and she resembles all other good mammas who care for their children, and who never lose sight of them, but help them lovingly, even when, on account of their foolishness and evil conduct, they deserve to be abandoned and left to themselves. Well then, the good fairy, as soon as she saw that I was in danger of drowning, sent immediately an immense shoal of fish, who, believing me really to be dead, began to eat me. And what mouthfuls they took! I should never have thought the fish were greedier than boys. Some ate my ears, some my muzzle, others my neck and mane, some the skin of my legs, some my coat, and amongst them there was a little fish so polite that he even condescended to eat my tail. From this time forth, said his purchaser, horrified, I swear that I will never eat a fish. It would be too dreadful to open a mallet or a fried whiting and to find inside a donkey's tail. <laughs> I agree with you, said the puppet, laughing. However, I must tell you that when the fish had finished eating the donkey's hide that covered me from head to foot, they naturally reached the bone, or rather the wood. For as you see, I am made of the hardest wood. But after giving a few bites, they soon discovered that I was not a morsel for their teeth. And disgusted with such indigestible food, they went off, some in one direction, some in another, without so much as saying thank you to me. And now, at last... I have told you how it was that when you pulled up the rope you found a live puppet instead of a dead donkey. <laughs> I laugh at your story, cried the man in a rage. I only know that I spent twenty pence to buy you and I will have my money back. Shall I tell you what I will do? I will take you back to the market and sell you a seasoned wood for lighting fires. Sell me if you like. I am content, said Pinocchio. But as he said it, he made a spring and plunged into the water. Swimming gaily away, he called to his poor owner, Goodbye, master! If you, if you should be in want of a skin to make a drum, remember me. And he laughed and went on swimming. And after a while he turned again and shouted louder, Goodbye, master. If you should be in want of a little well-seasoned word for lighting the fire, remember me. In the twinkling of an eye, 
he had swum so far off that he was scarcely visible. All that could be seen of him was a little black speck on the surface of the sea that from time to time lifted its legs out of the water and leapt and capered like a dolphin enjoying himself. I leave you to imagine how rapidly poor Pinocchio's heart began to beat. He swam with redoubled strength and energy towards the white rock, and he was already halfway when he saw, rising up out of the water and coming to meet him, the horrible head of a sea monster. His wide, open, cavernous mouth and his three rows of enormous teeth would have been terrifying to look at, even in a picture. This sea monster was neither more nor less than that gigantic dogfish who had been mentioned many times in this story. Only think of poor Pinocchio's terror at the sight of the monster. He tried to avoid it, to change his direction. He tried to escape, but that immense wide open mouth came towards him with the velocity of an arrow. Be quick, Pinocchio, for pity's sake! Be quick! And Pinocchio swam desperately with his arms, his chest, his legs and his feet. Quick, Pinocchio, the monster is close upon you, quick! And Pinocchio swam quicker than ever and flew on with the rapidity of a ball from a gun. He had nearly reached the rock and the little goat, leaning over towards the sea, stretched out her forelegs to help him out of the water. But it was too late. The monster had overtaken him, and drawing his breath, he sucked in the poor puppet as if sucking a hen's egg. He swallowed him with such violence. Pinocchio, in falling into the dogfish's stomach, received such a blow that he remained unconscious for a quarter of an hour afterwards. When he came to himself again after the shock, he could not in the least imagine what world he was in. All around him it was quite dark, and the darkness was black and profound, that it seemed to him he had fallen head downwards into an inkstand full of ink. He listened. He could hear no noise. Only from time to time great gusts of wind blew in his face. At first he could not understand where the wind came from, but at last he discovered it came out of the monster's lungs. For you must know that the dogfish suffered very much from asthma, and when he breathed it was exactly as if a north wind was blowing. Pinocchio at first tried to keep up his courage, but when he had one proof after another that he was really shut up in the body of this sea monster, he began to cry and scream, to sob, Help! Help! Will nobody come to save me? Who do you think you could save, you unhappy wretch? said a voice in the dark that sounds like a guitar out of tune. Who is speaking? asked Pinocchio, frozen with terror. It is I. I am a poor Tony who was swallowed by the dogfish at the same time that you were. Oh, oh, what fish are you? I have nothing in common with fish. I am a puppet. Then if you are not a fish, why, why did you let yourself be swallowed by the monster? I didn't let myself be swallowed. It was the monster swallowed me. And now, what are we to do in here in the dark? Resign ourselves and wait until the dogfish has digested us both. But I do not want to be digested, howled Pinocchio, beginning to cry. Neither do I want to be digested, added Thune. But I am enough of a philosopher to console myself in thinking that when one is born as a Thune, it is more dignified to die in the water than in oil. That is all nonsense, cried Pinocchio. It is my opinion, replied the Thune. And opinions, to say the political, Thunes ought to be respected. To sum it all up, I want to get away from here. I want to escape. Escape if you are able. I is this dogfish who has swallowed us very big? asked the puppet. Big? Why, only imagine his body is two miles long without counting his tail. Whilst they were holding this conversation in the dark, Pinocchio thought that he saw a light a long way off. 
What is that little light I see in the distance? he asked. It is most likely some companion in misfortune who is waiting like us to be digested. I will go and find him. Do you think that it may be by chance some old fish who perhaps could show us how to escape? I hope it may be so with all my heart, dear puppet. Goodbye, Tony. Goodbye, puppet, and good fortune to you. We shall meet again? Whoa, who can say? It is better not even to think of it.